Hi everybody, uh, this is Dr. Jan Kristalaw here today on behalf of the Canadian Network for International Surgery. And I wanted to just say a brief few words about cesarean section preparation. We've talked a lot about the procedure itself and I, there are some principles that I think are very important to keep in mind as per, we're preparing for the operation itself. Proper preparation is really as important as the surgery itself. If you're not prepared, if you don't anticipate possible problems, if you haven't thought about the whole patient, her comfort and her safety, you're not ready to do this cesarean section. Now, the other thing to think about is the more routine your steps of preparation become, the faster you can do them in times of emergency. And in obstetrics, this is something that we always have to be ready to do. Now, having said that, we always do all the steps, even though you may need to modify them in the case of an acute emergency. For example, a critically ill woman who is uh, having a massive hemorrhage may not get a full explanation of the risks of be and benefits of the cesarean section, uh, but uh, you need to proceed, of course, uh, and make sure that you save her life, which is your first job. So let's talk a little bit about what you need to do and some of the steps that you cannot uh, skip in terms of the preparation. The history and physical. You need to know your patient. You need to know why you're doing the C-section. And as I've told you before in other lectures, it's really important to be satisf satisfied in yourself that you're doing this for a valid indication uh, and uh, that you know exactly uh, why you're doing it. And the history and physical should include the indications for surgery, whether it's breach or whether it's an abruption or whatever it is, please include that as part of your history. It's very important from a record keeper point of view that we know why you did what you did. Secondly, the explanation of the procedure and the consent. Now, we've talked a little bit about uh, this discussion of risks before, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in the lecture that you're gonna see in a few minutes. Um, and you need to do this as much as possible. But we do realize, as I've already mentioned, that in the time of an acute crisis, sometimes it does need to be expedited and you just need to move in order to save the woman's life. Thirdly, of course, there are the lab tests. Even in a position where you, you, the, the, um, the, your lab support is not ideal, you still need to try to get a CBC, a type and screen, and a cross match, if at all possible. Number four, IV access, one of the most important things, and this is why I highlight it here. IV access is really the conduit. It's really the, uh, the gateway to making sure that everything else is done safely, whether it's hydration of the patient, management of her blood pressure, management of uh, the drugs that will uh, diminish the risk of postpartum hemorrhage, prophylactic antibiotics, etc. And after you have that IV access, do think about prophylactic antibiotics, especially if sepsis is a concern, but even if it's not. Uh, we know increasingly that the use of prophylactic antibiotics is one of the biggest steps forward in terms of assuring the safety of our obstetrical patients. Next, antacids. Antacids such as sodium citrate or ranitidine, uh, given either orally or IV. Now, the reason we think about this um, is that even if we are doing a spinal anesthetic, there's always a chance of having to end up with a general anesthetic. Even if the spinal works, if you get into a bleeding situation or something else, you may always need to put that patient to sleep. So in fact, um, in that situation, of course, protection of the airway is paramount. And as you know very well, uh, using these drugs it does reduce the risk of an aspiration pneumonia, which is why we use them. Seven, and I've alluded to this before, the bladder should be catheterized and the catheter left in for the duration of surgery. First of all, it moves the, the bladder out of the way of the surgery and it also allows you to measure the urine output and assure adequate hydration. 
And um, the last point I might wanted to make on this slide, if the head is well down, consider disimpacting the head from below prior to starting. And that is especially true if vaginal birth has been attempted. Sometimes if we've attempted to pull the head down with a vacuum, we'll have created a situation where the head is quite uh, quite stuck in the pelvis and pushing it up gently um, it will actually really make the delivery of the head at cesarean section much, much easier. You have to do this carefully because, in fact, if you push it up roughly, there is a chance of rupturing the uterus. So these are the things to always look for. Always assure that the patient is wedged slightly to the left, at least 15 degrees to avoid supine hypotension. We've talked about this before as well. This is true any time after 20 weeks, but certainly true when you're doing a cesarean section for term gravida. Next, listen to the heart before beginning the cesarean section. You need to make sure that the fetal heart is still audible. You do not want to be doing a, a cesarean section for fetal distress if the baby has actually um, uh, died in utero. It's very important to do this and to get a sense of what the fetal heart uh, is prior to starting. You may also hear a fetal heart that's uh, diminished at this point, and 90, 90 beats per minute, for example. And this may actually say to you that, yes, the baby's still alive, but I better get in there as fast as I can. So the fetal heart is very important in, in determining how you move in the next few minutes. And assure that all personnel are ready, the surgeon, the anesthetist, uh, the assistant, whoever's caring for the baby and nursing support as well. Now we've talked about this and you've done some of these, uh, some of these exercises over the week, but we know that the safest way of delivering any obstetrical care is as a team. And teamwork is the number one thing that's going to assure that your patients have a safe delivery. Now, when we look back at some of the cases that have not gone well, what we always find is that the lack of teamwork and communication is almost always an issue in terms of things going uh, unexpectedly badly. So keep this in mind, assure that your team is all there, has communicated with each other, and is ready to work together for the good of the woman in front of you. A little bit about the surgical safety checklist. I know you've heard about this and you've seen it at the cesarean section station that you did yesterday. This was developed and endorsed by the WHO. The idea is that it's done routinely at each operation. And using the checklist alone has been shown to reduce surgical morbidity and mortality. So it's really quite a powerful tool. It doesn't take long to do. It's not onerous and it's very, very good at actually keeping everyone on the same page. This has been studied widely around the world. A large multi-centered studies done both in developing and developed countries and also small and big hospitals and rural settings. It is all, they've all shown that the surgical safety checklist does enhance the safety for your patients and improve their, uh, um, their uh, chances, both in terms of mortality and morbidity. In Canada, uh, we've embraced this completely and we re released uh, the guidelines um, in January uh, 2013, so eight years ago now. And what we did was we produced a modified version for obstetrics. The reason why we did that was because obviously when you're doing a cesarean section, a left versus right is not an issue as it is in, in ortho, for example. Uh, and there are some other things that may not apply. And we also know that sometimes, as I've already alluded to, uh, having to move very quickly in an extreme emergent situation, you have to have the flexibility to do that. So we've built that into our guidelines. So there's three phases of it. First of all, the signing in or briefing. So what you're doing is you're just saying out loud, you're identifying the patient, the procedure, and stating that consent has been uh, received. 
you're also saying out loud what you anticipate in terms of problems and you're preparing for any possible problems such as excess excess blood loss difficult airway impacted head or anything else that you think may be encountered during the surgery what you're doing is you're sharing your thoughts with your team so everyone is anticipating uh, any potential problems together the second is the timeout and this confirms whatever medications you need to do whether it's uh, confirmatory uh, con confirming the antibiotics or the dvt prophylaxis or whatever other choices you've made in terms of of uh, preparation for this particular patient and it also gives you a chance to address concerns from the team members this may t be the time for example where you realize that the, this patient wanted a tubal ligation and has requested that it be done at the same time as her cesarean section the third phase is the sign out or debrief at this point you're finished the surgery and you're reviewing the operation you're taking a deep breath and you're, and you're saying to yourself whether or not it went well or badly you're doing your sponge, sponge and instrument count you're evaluating any equipment issues that you had so you'll do you'll be ready for the next uh, procedure and you're also talking about any post-operative concerns so for example if you've had some excessive blood loss you want to you want to talk about the kind of extra monitoring that you might need for this patient over the next 24 hours or the extra blood work for example if somebody is, has had a significant bleed or if you're worried about an impending DIC or some other uh, possible complication so that's the sign out or the debrief here's the checklist and uh, you would have seen this in your uh, stations last night as well uh, and it goes through the same things as we've just talked about so before the induction of anesthesia uh, you are going through the initial checklist of who the patient is is the site marked uh, and um, is is the patient who ready for this surgery and secondly before the skin incision with the nurse and the anesthetist and the surgeon um, and you're confirming that everybody is on the same page and everybody has the same expectations of the surgery and thirdly before the patient leaves the operating room uh, you're verbally naming the procedure completing the instrument count labeling any specimens and talking about any equipment problems that need to be addressed before you leave the operating room so that they don't persist and uh, again be problems in the next case and so for, and for the surgeon and the anesthetist what are the key concerns for recovery and the management of this patient communication is key in all of these and that's really the whole point of the surgical safety checklist so what can you do well first of all you can always be prepared as you possibly can be you can be an advocate for your patients you can always advocate the patient's safety is in the middle of everything you do and do whatever you can to make sure that every time you go to the operating room you do everything you can to make sure that each operation is as safe and uh, and uh, prepared as possible secondly you can advocate for the, the use of the checklist and set an example for others I know in many situations there is resistance to at using a checklist because it's seen as one extra step that may add time and complexity at a time when no one wants added time and complexity but in the end it will be a positive move be familiar with it and participate in all three steps the more familiar you are with it the faster it will go and the more it will actually just become second nature to you to do it every time and talk to your hospital about using it if in fact you're not using it already so really in summary uh, for this very short lecture what I really want to say is be prepared think things through before you start the surgery make sure everything is in place make sure you have a cohesive team that communicates well with each other and that everyone has the patient's well-being at the very cent center of their consciousness each and every time you start an operation thanks for your attention